he was a king before he got to the NBA. As Rex Chapman was one of the most well-known people in Kentucky as a teenager throughout the mid to late 80s. His incredible jumping and dunking excited fans and his long range shooting ability was rare to see back then. But what really made fans love him was his unwavering confidence as he was going to keep shooting and keep attacking no matter how many he had missed or who was guarding him. And if he was hot, he could hang with the best. He had a legendary high school career followed by two great seasons at the University of Kentucky. He would join the Charlotte Hornets as their first ever rookie draft pick and play three and a half solid seasons there. But injuries came quickly for Chapman, and it seemed like he was never playing at 100%. He had some great moments in Washington, Miami, and Phoenix, but his streaky shooting and inability to stay healthy always made it feel like it should have been more. And sadly, a late career opioid addiction would engulf his life after retirement. But Rex Chapman was a unique and exciting player during the 90s, and one that could get you out of your seat. And even though his career didn't go as well as hoped, he showed he was without a doubt an NBA caliber player. Let's jog your memory. An Owensboro native, Chapman spent his high school years playing for Apollo High School, where he was must-see entertainment. As a freshman in 1983, a 5'8 Chapman would already be on varsity, albeit as a reserve, with a great shooting stroke. And then by 1984, he was a 6'1 sophomore, leading his team in scoring with 19.6 points per game. By his junior year in 1985, he was one of the best players in the state, averaging 27.5 points, 8 rebounds, and 4 assists per game on nearly 54% shooting, while also blocking 60 shots, as he led Apollo to a 27-7 record and a third region title, as he would score 39 points in the final and ultimately be named All-State. Before his senior season, Chapman would commit to the University of Kentucky, as at the time he was considered by some to be the best prospect to ever come out of the state. Chapman was nothing short of celebrity status during his senior year, as a game between Apollo and Henry Clay drew 11,000 fans, and during the Bluegrass Tournament, he had to sneak out the back door to avoid the mob of people. By this point, Chapman was about 6'4", and on top of possessing a textbook shooting form, could also jump out of the gym. In his senior year, he would lead Apollo to a 25-5 record behind averages of 25.6 points, 8.3 rebounds, and 4.6 assists per game as he would again be named All-State, a McDonald's All-American, a first-team parade All-American, and Kentucky's Mr. Basketball. Going into his freshman year in 1987, Kentucky was reeling a bit. They were coming off an Elite Eight appearance, but had just lost their star senior Kenny Walker, and on top of that, their next best player, Winston Bennett, would be lost for the year with a knee injury. It should have been tough for Chapman to live up to his lofty expectations, but he made it look easy. As a freshman, Chapman led the team in scoring and assists while finishing third on the team in steals. In his very first exhibition game versus Yugoslavia, he had 18 points on 6 of 7 shooting. Then just a couple days after Christmas, he had one of his most memorable games, when he scored 26 in a rout of Louisville. And then on February 11th would lead Kentucky to a comeback win versus Tennessee behind another 26 point performance. And finally in a February 28th game versus Ole Miss, he would hit a 12 footer with just 6 seconds left to give Kentucky a one point win. Chapman would score in double figures in 24 of Kentucky's 29 games as he would be named SEC Freshman of the Year and second team All SEC. An 18 and 10 Kentucky squad would get a tournament berth as an eight seed, but they would lose in the first round to Ohio State as Chapman played terribly with 13 points on four of 16 shooting before fouling out. But his freshman season would see him average about 16 points, three and a half assists and a steal per game. Bennett had returned from his injury going into the 88 season, and his return helped Kentucky greatly improve their scoring offense. Yet Chapman would still be the team's best scorer, while also finishing first on the team in steals and second in assists, as this season would see him named first team all conference. In just the third game of the year, he would help lead the team to a win over Indiana, which snapped their 21 game winning streak. But then late in the year, on February 24th versus LSU, a collision resulted in Chapman cracking a bone in his lower back. It was thought that this would keep him out for the rest of the regular season and the conference tournament, but after sitting out just one game, he would be back, as Kentucky ended the year on a four-game win streak with a record of 22-5, and five, and they would continue winning throughout the conference tourney, as they beat Ole Miss, LSU, and then Georgia to become SEC champions. So now a 25-5 and five Kentucky team was entering the NCAA tournament as a two-seed. Chapman would score 23 points on 10 of 13 shooting while dishing five assists in a first-round defeat of Southern, but round two versus Maryland wasn't looking good, as at halftime, Kentucky was up by just one, and Chapman had three points on one of six shooting. 
but he would then score 20 points on 8 of 12 shooting in the second half as Kentucky won by 9. The Sweet 16 brought Villanova, and even though Chapman scored a career-high 30 points while going 5 of 9 from deep, Kentucky would be upset, ending their season. But Chapman's sophomore year saw him average about 19 points, 3 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. Shortly after the season, Chapman had indicated that he would return for at least one more year with Kentucky. But then about a month later, he would instead declare for the NBA draft. He would say that he was doing this strictly because he felt he had the talent, ability, and maturity to take the next step. But Kentucky had also recently come under investigation for recruitment violations, which may have influenced Chapman's decision, although he would say it had no influence. At the time, a player entering the draft as a sophomore was extremely uncommon, as Chapman would be the only underclassman taken in the first round, and he wasn't a late pick either, as after seven seniors were taken off the board, the newly formed Charlotte Hornets were on the clock for the first time in their franchise's history. For the eighth pick in the draft, and their first in the NBA, the Charlotte Hornets select Rex Chapman of Kentucky. Similar to his arrival at Kentucky, expectations would be high for Chapman as the top pick of an expansion team. In the 88 expansion draft, the Hornets were able to get some decent talent in guys like Del Curry and Muggsy Bogues, and would also make a trade to acquire two-time All-Star Kelly Tripuka from Utah. The first year of existence for the Charlotte Hornets went about as you'd expect, as they would finish as one of the worst teams in the league. And the NBA was new to Chapman in every regard, as he would say that the first NBA game he played in was also the first NBA game he ever saw. So it was a shock to him how much better and stronger the competition was. Chapman would say his first 20 games were terrible, and it's true they weren't great, as he was only shooting about 38% and averaging 13 points and 3 assists over the first 20 games, as Charlotte started the year 6-14. and 14. He would improve as the season went on and would finish second on the team in scoring behind Tripuka, while also finishing the year third among rookies in scoring, as he was named second team all-rookie. Overall, he would hit double figures in 64 games and would even drop 37 in a March 12th loss to Sacramento. But perhaps most impressive was that while playing nearly 30 minutes per game, he finished second in the league in turnover percentage, as throughout his career, he would be exceptional at taking care of the ball. The rest of Charlotte's season would be uneventful, as the team finished with the second worst record in the league at 20-62, and, and Chapman's rookie year saw him average about 17 points, 2.5 assists, and a steal per game. The Hornets began the 1990 season looking the same, but they were playing even worse, as they lost their first 5 games of the year, and on December 13th were 3-16, and on the tail end of a 10-game losing streak, when they would trade Kurt Rambis and a pick to Phoenix for Armin Gilliam. Gilliam would become the team's leading scorer for the rest of the season, with Chapman finishing second. But Chapman continued to struggle with efficiency, as after shooting slightly above 41% last year, he wouldn't be able to even crack 41% this year. However, injuries would limit him to just 54 games, as they would be one of the biggest obstacles in his career. But he would still hit double figures in 46 games, while also recording 38 points on two separate occasions. The Hornets continued losing, and once they hit 8-32, and 32, head coach Dick Harder was fired and replaced with assistant Gene Littles. At the time of the firing, the Hornets had lost 5 straight, and this losing streak would extend to 12 games. But during the losing streak was the All-Star break, where Chapman would participate in the dunk contest and bust out his trademark flip dunk. But the Hornets were not much better under Littles, as they would go 11-31 with him at the helm, ultimately finishing with the league's third worst record at 19-63. And, and for the regular season, Chapman averaged about 17.5 points, 2.5 assists, and a steal per game. The Hornets would have the 5th pick in the 1990 draft and would select Illinois star Kendall Gill, who happened to play the same position as Chapman, so he had some competition. Additionally, on January 5th, Charlotte would send Gilliam to Philly for center Mike Gaminski. The Hornets had also picked up Johnny Newman in free agency, and he would lead the team in scoring, with Chapman again finishing second. Chapman had seen his scoring drop, but he was taking smarter shots, as he would take almost 4 less shots per game, but would shoot 44.5% from the field, and over 32% from deep, and he would also bump his assists up to over 3.5 per game while averaging less than 2 turnovers. He would record double figures in 55 games, as well as 2 games with at least 35, and he would record his first career double-double in a January 16th loss to Denver, when he had 23 points and 11 assists. Chapman would again find himself in the dunk contest during the 91 All-Star break, and he would put together a better performance yet it still wasn't enough to win. Littles remained the coach, and as the year went on, Gill would enter the starting lineup and play well, so it was looking like the Hornets may have a decision to make in the near future. 
the Hornets improved, but still ended the year at 26 and 56 and missed the playoffs again, as Chapman would average about 15 and a half points, three and a half assists, and a steal per game. Going into the 91 draft, the Hornets had the top pick and would select UNLV's Larry Johnson, and they would also have a new coach in Allen Bristow. Chapman was quickly falling out of favor, as Gill was now a full-time starter, so the Hornets would try Chapman at point guard. He would be a starter for the first 11 games of the year, but was struggling, as he was averaging less than 11 points on less than 40% shooting. But he would record a double-double in a November 9th loss to New York, when he had 13 points and a career-high 11 assists. Chapman would be relegated to a bench roll after his poor start, and would play 10 more games, until going down with a bruised heel. And after sitting out 30 games, Chapman, who was at the time the Hornets' all-time leading scorer, would get a change of scenery. An unhappy Chapman was acquired by the Washington Bullets for Tom Hammonds, and Hornets management would blatantly say that the trade wasn't made because Hammonds was a great player, it was made because of Chapman, and Chapman would confirm that he needed a change, as both he and the Hornets were unhappy, and with so much change going on in Charlotte, Chapman had wanted a fresh start for a while. The Bullets weren't very good either, but they featured some solid players, like point guard Michael Adams, small forward Harvey Grant, and the soon-to-be most improved player of the year, Purvis Ellison. The Bullets were sitting at 18-34 and 34 at the time of the trade, and knew they were taking a risk on an injured Chapman, and this season would essentially be a throwaway for Chapman, as his injury, which was an Achilles issue, wouldn't heal quickly, and he would make his first and only appearance for the Bullets in the last game of the season, when he had 10 points and 3 assists in 22 minutes of action against the Sixers, for a Bullets team who finished at 25-57, and 57, and his shortened season saw him average about 12.5 points, a career-high 4 assists, and half a steal per game. In the 92 draft, the Bullets had taken a forward out of NC State named Tom Gugliotta, and it seemed like they were going to have a solid offense. But then Ellison would struggle with a knee injury and only play 49 games. Chapman would begin the year as a starter, but after an 11-25 start, head coach Wes Unseld would decide Chapman would be better suited as an offensive spark plug off the bench. Unfortunately, Washington's offense would still rank bottom 5 in the league, yet Chapman would prove to be a very useful player, as he would be one of 5 players on the team to average double figures, and the only non-starter, while doing so on nearly 48% from the field, and over 37% from deep. He would hit double figures in 34 games, while recording 2 games with at least 30, and Chapman's first game of the season saw him drop 25 points on his former team in a loss. But he would also again deal with injuries, which would limit him to just 60 games this year, with an ankle injury keeping him out for over a month late in the season, as the Bullets would again do a lot of losing, going 22-60 and 60 and missing the playoffs. But for the regular season, Chapman would average about 12.5 points, 2 assists, and half a steal per game. The Bullets needed insurance for the often injured Ellison, and Harvey Grant had made it clear that he would be testing free agency after the season. So the Bullets sent him to the Blazers for center Kevin Duckworth during the offseason. And this would elevate Chapman back into a starting role, and he looked ready. He would finish tied for first on the team in scoring, alongside a career year from Don McLean. The Bullets didn't have a great start to the year, but were sitting at 12-22 and, and on a three-game win streak, going into a January 17th matchup with San Antonio. Up to this point, Chapman was averaging 19.5 points while shooting over 50% in 32 games. But early in this game, he would experience yet another injury. In the midst of the best year of his career, Chapman came down from making a layup and dislocated his ankle. The injury would keep him out for the next 21 games, yet when he did return, he still played well, hitting double figures in all but one of the final 24 games he played, and even scoring his career high of 39 points on 15 of 26 shooting in a March 20th loss to Denver, as he would end the year shooting a career high 49.8% from the field and a career high 38.8% from deep, which would be a top 20 mark in the league. But the Bullets went 5 and 17 without Chapman and would finish the year at 24 and 58 and miss the playoffs. And for the regular season, Chapman averaged about 18 points, 3 assists, and a steal per game. The Bullets had selected Juwan Howard out of Michigan in the 1994 NBA draft, and then after just 6 games, they would trade Gugliotta to Golden State to acquire one of Howard's Michigan teammates in Chris Webber. And with the second year Calvert Chaney getting a much larger role in the offense, just like that, Chapman was no longer a major part of the team's game plan. He would continue struggling with injuries as he would miss a few weeks in February with a broken thumb, as well as miss the last 10 games of the year. He did begin the year as a starter, but was putting up some very inefficient shooting performances, and after his thumb injury, he would be relegated to the bench, as overall he would appear in just 45 games this year. 
He would still hit double figures in 38 of them and have three games with at least 30, but he went from shooting nearly 50% in 94 to shooting below 40% in 95, and his three-point shooting would also drop significantly. However, he was also attempting a career-high 6.1 threes per game, and with Weber only playing 54 games and Howard only playing 65, the Bullets had another losing year, finishing at 21-61 and, and missing the playoffs. And for the regular season, Chapman averaged about 16 points, 3 assists, and 1.5 and steals per game. But Chapman's time in Washington was about to come to an end. On July 2nd, Chapman was traded to Miami, in a move that was completely overshadowed by the Heat hiring Pat Riley a couple months later, and Riley making a trade for All-Star Alonzo Mourning a couple months after that. A healthy Chapman could have acted as a sidekick to Mourning, but as had become the theme of Chapman's career, he wasn't healthy. He would deal with acute Achilles tendonitis, which would keep him on the sideline to start the year, and ultimately lead to him getting surgery in late November, which prolonged his Miami debut until December 28th. When he did return, he was struggling, and although he would put together a few good games, he had underwhelmed going into a February 23rd game versus Chicago, which was going to be a tough task for Miami, as injuries along with the acquisition of Tim Hardaway at the trade deadline the day before, left Miami having only 8 players available to take on a 48-6 Bulls team who were on their way to a 72-10 season. So the 24-29 Heat weren't supposed to have a chance, but no one told Chapman that. Chapman would start with 10 quick points before Michael Jordan decided to take matters into his own hands, as he would begin checking Chapman full court. But it didn't matter who was on Chapman on this night, as he kept scoring, and it got to the point that Phil Jackson would make the decision to switch Jordan off of Chapman in favor of Steve Kerr. As by halftime, Chapman had 24 points and had hit 6 three-pointers, as Miami was up by 18. In the third quarter, Chapman would foul Jordan hard, which led to the two jawing, which Chapman has downplayed, as he and Jordan had been friends for some time and even shared the same agent. But later rumors would come out that he was letting Jordan know that he could not guard him. Usually stories of players talking to Jordan don't end well for that player, and although Jordan would finish the game with 31 points, Chapman outplayed him tying his career high with 39 points while going 9 of 10 from beyond the arc, as the Heat handed Chicago their 7th loss of the year. Overall, Chapman would appear in 56 games this year, starting 50 of them, as he hit double figures in 40 games and would have 11 games with at least 20. But his shooting was still below 43%, yet his 3-point shooting had elevated to over 37%, while still attempting 6 per game. The Heat would stick around the 500 mark all season and end the year at 42 and 40 which got Rex Chapman his first career playoff appearance. But the Bulls were waiting for them, and you can bet Michael Jordan didn't forget about February 23rd. The Bulls would run through Miami with a dominant three-game sweep, which saw Jordan average 30 points on over 51% shooting. The new Heat duo of Mourning and Hardaway would be the team's top two scorers, with Chapman finishing as the third leading scorer. Yet he would only average 9 points on less than 43% from the field, while also going just 3 of 13 from deep as he would hit double figures in two of the three games. And for the regular season, he would average about 14 points, three assists, and a steal per game. Over the summer, the Heat renounced the rights to Chapman, which he was upset about, as he would say that Pat Riley had told him that they would take care of him, and that the one thing Chapman had asked for was that he didn't get a one-year deal. Yet that was what Miami offered. Additionally, he would overestimate his value and reject a two-year offer from the Pacers worth over $2 million, eventually having to sign for the league minimum with Phoenix. But it was during his time in Phoenix that Chapman began routinely taking painkillers. Chapman joined a Phoenix Suns team who had just lost Charles Barkley, yet had received Sam Cassell and Robert Ory in return. However, both of these players would be gone before season's end. The team did still feature star point guard Kevin Johnson, who would play his last great season this year. But even though Phoenix had lost a star in Barkley, they had acquired another during the season as after a poor 8-19 and 19 start, they sent a package including Cassell and second-year swingman Michael Finley to the Mavs for their all-star point guard Jason Kidd. Chapman would appear in the starting lineup at different points throughout the year until he was made a starter in early March for the remainder of the year. He was playing well for the team, as he would finish third in scoring and had improved his shooting to over 44% from the field and 35% from deep, as he was attempting just under 5 threes per game. He would hit double figures in 51 games, including 12 games with at least 20, and he would also play in 65 games this year, which was his highest total since 1991. But it wasn't so much that he was healthy, it was just that he didn't feel the pain, as he had been prescribed Vicodin for a nerve condition in his foot, which was the beginning of an unfortunate addiction. And with all the changes in Phoenix, it was difficult for them to get anything going, as they would finish the year at 40 and 42, 
but would get a first round matchup with Seattle, where Chapman would more than make up for last year's postseason debut. The Suns would win game one, as Chapman put together arguably the best game of his career, as he would score 42 points on 12 of 22 shooting, and would also knock down 9 threes in this performance, which at the time would set the record for most threes in a playoff game. Game 2 was an embarrassing 44 point loss for Phoenix, as the team shot below 27%, yet Chapman was the lone bright spot, as he had a team high 18 points on 50% shooting. The Suns would go up 2-1, after Chapman scored a team high 23 points on over 57% shooting in game 3, and in game 4, he would have 22, 5, and 4, yet had been shooting poorly, especially from deep, as with the fourth quarter winding down, he was 3 for 10 from deep. But with less than 5 seconds left, and the Suns down by 3, Chapman hit a running 3 to force overtime. Unfortunately, Phoenix couldn't capitalize as they would lose in overtime, leading to a series deciding game 5, where Seattle would blow out Phoenix as Chapman had his worst game of the series, with 16 points on 6 of 13 shooting, yet would still finish the series as the team's leading scorer at over 24 per game, and his regular season would see him average about 14 points, 3 assists, and a steal per game. Going into 98, the Suns had acquired third-year forward Antonio McDice from Denver, and had signed free agent Clifford Robinson, and this extra offense was needed, as injuries limited Johnson to 50 games this year, with much lower production. Chapman would play in 68 games this year, and for the first and only time in his career, he would lead his team in scoring outright. He would hit double figures in 53 games, have 21 games with at least 20, and 2 with at least 30. And although he was shooting less than 43% from the field, he would shoot over 38% from deep. The Suns had hired Danny Ainge during last season, and with a full year of him coaching, they put together a great year, as they finished 56-26 and, and won 11 of their last 12 games, which included a 10-game win streak so they were hot going into a first round matchup with San Antonio. However, late in the year, Chapman had sustained a hamstring injury which kept him out of game 1, as Phoenix lost. He would play 35 minutes in game 2, scoring 16 points as the Suns even the series, but he then managed just 23 minutes, scoring 2 points on 1 of 9 shooting in a game 3 loss, until his hamstring would keep him out of game 4, which the Suns would lose to end their year. But for the regular season, Chapman averaged about 16 points, 3 assists, and a steal per game. 1999 was a lockout shortened season, and in a strange sequence of events, McDice, who was a free agent, would return to Denver, and Kevin Johnson had also retired. But the Suns did make what was at the time a great pickup, in signing Chapman's former teammate Tom Gugliotta. And shortly before the season started, Phoenix would extend Chapman for 6 years and about $22 million. Unfortunately, Chapman looked to be slowing down, as his 12.1 points per game this year would be a then career low and he would do so while shooting a terrible 35.9% from the field. He would remain a starter and would hit double figures in 23 games, while having 6 games with at least 20, but he would again deal with injuries, including more foot problems. However, this time it was turf toe, yet the Suns would still finish at 27-23 and, and get a first round matchup with Portland, but Portland would sweep Phoenix easily, as Chapman would really struggle, putting up less than 6 points per game and shooting less than 29% from the field. But for the regular season, he would average about 12 points, 3 assists, and a steal per game. 2000 would be another injury riddled year for Chapman, and his body wasn't able to handle starter minutes anymore, as his 18.1 minutes per game would be a career low by far. And the Suns had made what looked to be a significant upgrade at Chapman's shooting guard position, as they had acquired former All Star Penny Hardaway from Orlando to pair with point guard Jason Kidd, as the two would become backcourt 2000. However, both these players would deal with injury, and Chapman would also be struggling with injuries all year as he appeared in 53 games, starting 19 of them. But the most unfortunate injury came in mid-March, when he needed an emergency appendectomy. And although there's worse injuries out there, he would be prescribed OxyContin for the pain, which would just further his addiction. The severity of Chapman's injury would end his year, as the Suns finished 53-29, and, and after defeating San Antonio in Round 1, would lose to the Lakers in Round 2. But Chapman's year saw him average about 6.5 points, one assist, and half a steal per game. And although he didn't want to believe it, Chapman knew that it was likely the end for him. Welcome back to our Suns Game Time Studios. Rex Chapman retiring on Monday and all the accolades, the tributes in the newspapers. Before training camp started, Chapman had wrist surgery, and he was also set to have ankle surgery later, as this would mark his seventh surgery in his four years with Phoenix. He would say that he knew after his appendectomy that he had played his last game, even though he didn't want it to be true and Suns owner Jerry Colangelo would still pay Chapman the $10 million he was due on his contract, as Chapman called it a career after 12 years. 
Unfortunately, his addiction to painkillers was only growing, especially after the Oxy prescription, as this would relieve him of the social anxiety that he dealt with throughout his career. But this evolved into a cycle of addiction, rehab, and even arrest over the next 15 years. But more recently, he has reinvented himself as a somewhat controversial TV and social media personality. Rex Chapman never met a shot he didn't like, and that could be a good thing or a bad thing. He was definitely a streaky shooter, and if you caught him on a good night, you were in trouble. But if you caught him on a bad night, he didn't really care, because he was going to keep shooting. But one part of his game you had to respect at all times was his long-range shooting, as he was one of the league's more dangerous threats at a time when threes were less common. And with a 39-inch vertical leap, he was a threat for a highlight dunk even in his later years. He was a Kentucky high school legend with all the pressure on his shoulders, and handled it well in his two years with the Wildcats, only to again have big expectations when he joined the expansion Charlotte Hornets. But injuries became a problem quickly and would plague the remainder of his career with Washington, Miami, and Phoenix. But even up until his final seasons, there was always a chance he could go off. He may not have been an efficient shooter, but he did take care of the ball, and even playing through injury after injury remained a serviceable starter throughout his career. And there will always be a gray area on what a fully healthy Rex Chapman could have done in the league. But that's it for today's episode on Rex Chapman. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his teammates in Charlotte. Or this one on one of his teammates in Washington and Phoenix. Thanks for watching and see you next time.